special delivery, right? So now we're in the book of Judges. There's, some, there's, there's something important to understand about Judges. There are two things that are said throughout the book of Judges constantly. One thing is that there was no king in Israel, right? Meaning that there was no, you, there was no unifying presence that, could, that was bringing all, everybody together. You see what I'm saying? The, 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 the tribes kind of operated loosely at that time. There was no strong leadership presence in, 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 um, in the kingdom of Israel. And the challenge that you have when there's no strong leadership is that it's hard to get things done. And it's hard to, for you to fully be who you should be. And I believe that the second thing that Judges often refers to happens as a result of the fact that there's no strong leadership in Israel. Because then it says, the other thing that it often says throughout the book of Judges is that every man did what was right in his own eyes. Right? Those are the two themes that you have in Judges. Every man did, does, did what was right in his own eyes. And we kind of see that even though Samson was the man of God, Samson, Samson often fell into the trap of doing what was right in his own eyes. Right? And so it's important. This is why I'm stressed. See, to me, the Bible, the, 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 the walk of faith is a very simple thing. It's not that deep. It's simply understanding how to hear what God is saying and then doing what God is saying, right? Every man did what was right in his own eyes. So let's take that back to what the, the, the story that I was just sharing with you, all right? I was trying to figure out what God would have me to go in, right? Let's say if I do a PhD. I could now go ahead and decide to do what is right in my own eyes, right? Maybe I can go for a PhD in, like, one of my interests is counseling psychology, I love counseling, like understanding psychology and counseling, what goes into that. Very interesting to me, right? But if I believe that God is telling me that you might want to go the route of the education, then what I have two choices, what God says and what's right in my own eyes. See what I'm saying? So, 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 so let's make this thing real. What, is God, what has God been showing you versus what have you been doing that seems right in your own eyes? Right? Right? In, in, in different aspects. Maybe, maybe we're talking about finances. Maybe we're talking about money right now. So, so maybe God has been telling you, maybe I should place my finances and do this particular thing with my money. But you like, God, that doesn't make sense. Let me do what's right in my own eyes. So we have this situation in the book of Judges where the theme is there's no king in Israel, there's no strong leadership, and every man is doing what is right in their own eyes. And so then all of a sudden we get to uh, Judges, uh, well, I'll read the first two verses of uh, chapter 13. It says, and then the people of Israel were back at it again, doing what was evil in God's sight. God put them, oh, well, I'm reading from the message version, uh, just so you know. God put them under the, do the domination of the Philistines for 40 years. All right. Then verse 2 says, at that time, there was a man named Manoah from Zorah, from the tribe of Dan. His wife was barren and childless, okay? His wife was barren and childless. And that's where I want to pick up from that verse uh, number three. So then we go to verse number three and it says, The angel of God appeared to her and told her, I know that you are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and bear a son. Now, I want, there are certain things in that one verse alone that I want you to pay attention to, right? It says... I know that you are barren. Yeah. And I feel like you should get excited about that. Yeah. Because what God, as I, as, that, as, that, as I read that verse, what God said to me is that, like, whatever you're going through, in whatever the barren situation, we just prayed over some situations this morning, yeah. whatever those barren situations are, you can be confident that God knows that you are barren. And that God knows that we talked about 40 years in the wilderness during the Sabbath school lesson for a little bit, right? When you talk about wilderness, often the wilderness, we can describe it partially as being often a barren place, right? So, so even though you are in the wilderness aspect of your life or in a wilderness place in your life or in a certain aspect of your life, God knows that you're in the wilderness, yeah. right? And even while you're in the wilderness, God is still able to take care of you, right? Because he still was able to take care of the children of Israel for 40 years, right? He still was able to take care of Jesus for 40 days while he was fasting, right? So, 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 so we serve a God who acknowledges and sees that you are in the wilderness. 
And be, it's because of that, right? Because part of solutions to problems is knowing that there is a problem. So the fact that Jesus knows that there's a problem, that there's barrenness, means that he can now address that problem that, we, that, 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 that we're having. Correct? So then watch this. Pay attention to the next thing that it says in that verse number 13. It says, listen, I know that you are barren, but watch this. But he says that even though you are the best of your natural life. Now watch this. Which verse is it in? Um, let me see really quickly. Okay, I think I'll, I'll address it in a, in a, in a, when I get further on along, right? So watch this. Verse 4 now. Verse 4 says, But take much care. Drink no wine or beer. Eat nothing ritually unclean. Right? Now, now watch this. What he's saying here, right? Don't, don't get caught up so much in the what he's saying not to do. Right? Just get, I, I just want you to understand the concept of what's going on here. What he's saying is that because what you have inside of you is special, you're going to have to do something different. You're going to have to be willing to do something different than what everybody else is doing. And here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. The challenge is, if you recall who we started with in the beginning of this, of this chapter, He's really not saying that you're going to have to do something different than what the rest of the world is doing. No. no. He's actually saying that you're going to have to do something different than what the rest of your own people are doing. Yeah. Right? Because remember, we started the verse or verse, verse 1. Hold on. Let me go back to it. Verse 1 starts off by saying, and then the people of Israel were back at it again, doing what was evil in God's sight. And God had to put them under the domination of the Philistines for 40 years, right? So then now we jump on down to verse 4, and he's like, listen, there's some things that you're going to have to do. Like, most other people who are giving birth to something, they don't have to really worry about doing any of this stuff. But because what I have in you is special, you have to do something different. That's how I realized in my own life, I'm like, God, you have put me through all of these challenges. Like, okay, so for instance, let's go back to the way that he made me a pastor, right? It's different than the route that other pastors usually traditionally go through in terms of becoming a pastor. But I had to realize and accept the fact that that's because what God is going to be doing through me is going to be different than what he's going to do through others, right? And, that, and it, there's nothing wrong with what he's doing through others, but what he's doing through me is going to be different. So, what, so, so how he has to bring it about and some of the things that he has to have me do are going to be different, are going to look different. So he challenges them that, listen, you're going to have to do something different because what, or what and who is in you is different. And then we jump on down to verse 5 and it says, you are, in f oh man, that's so beautiful. You are, in fact, pregnant right now, Amen. carrying a son. No razor will touch his head. The boy will be God's Nazarite from the moment of his birth. He will launch the deliverance from Philistine oppression, right? So, 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 so pay attention to what's going on in that verse because first it says, and, and, and just follow with me, okay? Because we're kind of all over the place, but there's a reason why we're all over the place. So first it starts off, you are barren. You will become. You will bear. Then I said that you will have. But then it says that, it, it's, it's almost like he said, okay, even though I told you you are barren and that you will bear, forget all of that. You're pregnant right now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he's, like, he's like, in fact, you're pregnant right now. Like, forget all of that. Like, like we already began the process in you. All right? It's all, so it's already in you. Okay? So, 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 so whatever you've been, and, and, and pastor has preached sermons like that before, where sometimes we're looking for what extra do I need before I begin to operate with the calling and the gifting that God has placed on my life. And what you have to understand is that God usually works in such a way where you start with what you already have, Amen. and then he will provide increase as you, can, as you begin using what he's already put in you, right? So when I, was a mu when I was a musician, I used what I had, being a musician. When I was uh, 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 an athlete, I used what I had, being an athlete. Some of you all have other gifts and talents that you already have within you, and so the goal is not to say, how do I become somebody else? 
or how do I figure out how to get what somebody else has before I begin doing what God has told me to do? The goal is to take what you already have right now and just start doing what God has told you to do right now with what you have. That, that, that's all Christianity is about. If you believe in God, then do what he has told you to do with the little that you have. So if you have just a couple of fish and a couple of loaves, then just say, okay, let me give this unto Jesus and render it unto Jesus so that Jesus can take it and do what he wants to do with it. And then what will happen is that Jesus will feed 5,000 with what you thought wasn't even enough for your own family. So if we stay on verse, on, on, on verse 5, that, that's what's important also, right? Because it says that the boy will be God's Nazarite, right? So what's in you belongs to God. Amen. Again, uh, uh, pastors and, and Dr. Susie Hill's theme, uh, um, total life stewardship. What's in you belongs to God. You are just to be a good steward of that thing. Amen. Whatever it is that you're pregnant with, right? But then this is a beautiful thing also, right? It says, he will launch the deliverance from Philistine oppression. Or he, referring to Samson or that thing that she was pregnant with, will launch the deliverance from Philistine oppression, right? And so this is the beautiful thing about it. It's like I said, you have been probably trying to search from without, trying to figure out what is going to change the situation of yourself, what is going to change the situation of your family? What is going to change the situation of your community? And God is like, listen, the thing that I have already made you pregnant with is the very thing that I'm trying to use in order to set my people free. So think about it. Like, like, like what, what has God already put in you? He's trying to figure out how to use that thing to set his people free. Then verse 6, the woman went to her husband and said, and when I say the thought, I, I, I don't want to run over this, maybe God gave me this thought for a reason, but, but so it was mentioned the health conference that will be going on in L.A. So he has given some people some information on health. Why? To set people free. You see what I'm saying? If, if, if you have it in you already, if, you, if you've been given the understanding of how to help heal people, use that to set somebody free. Deliver them. That's why God gave it to you. So verse 6 says, The woman went to her husband and said, A man of God came to me. He looked like the angel of God, terror-laced with glory. I didn't ask him where he was from, and he didn't tell me his name. And what was beautiful about that is that once, the, once God spoke to her, she immediately began to speak it to somebody else. She published what God spoke to her, meaning that she had to believe. This verse was so powerful when Dr. Hill said it the other day in one of his sermons. The verse, I forgot exactly where it's taken from, but when the disciple said, we believed, therefore we spoke. And some of us are often hesitant to speak. See, one of the reasons why it's even scary for me to give you all the testimony that I gave you this morning about the PhD, because it already now becomes scary in my head because now if I don't walk that thing out, I'm like, man, there are a bunch of people who are here to hold me accountable now. Yes. And sometimes the reason why we don't speak certain things is because just in case, we, we want to be careful just in case it doesn't work out. Why? Because, because we feel like we have to uh, give ourselves an out just in case it doesn't come to pass the way that we think that it should come to pass. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to believe what God said to the death of me. Right. And that's why I believe that sometimes we don't see as much power as we would like to in our lives and collectively because we are always giving ourselves an out. And God is like, well, as long as you have an out, there's no need for me to work because I like to do things when you have no out. And then I show up like we're going to make this happen even when it seems impossible. So speak it, publish it. Verse eight says, Manoah prayed to God. Master, let the man of God you sent come to us again and teach us how to raise this boy who is to be born. Now, Manoah thought he was kind of slick, right? Because Manoah, Manoah was like, well, listen, I'm not sure that I really trust um, the word that came through my wife. But I, but I don't want to downplay it either, right? So Manoah almost kind of tries to give himself an out. So he's like, listen, uh, if, if my wife said something, 
and you actually already taught her uh, what she should do, uh, come down again and teach it to us again. You know, uh, you know this thing that you that you said unto my wife, right? But God is good because He doesn't even like. He could have rebuked him right there, but God's like, well, I'll leave it alone, right? We're just going to go on with the process. But God, God showed him some mercy and some grace, right? Then verse 19 says, I'm skipping all the way down to verse 19, y'all. So this is after uh, the angel comes back and speaks to Manoah again, um, and he goes over all of those things all over again. Then we jump on down to verse 19. It says, so Manoah took the kid and the grain offering and sacrificed them on a rock altar to God who works wonders. And what I took from that verse is that this thing that God says that he has put in you and the deliverance that he says that he will do through what is already in you, it's important that you understand that it is, it is going to require that you make some sacrifices. It's going to require that you make some sacrifices, right? So after God said, after God said, listen, these are the things that, this, this is what's going to, like, I'm going to birth this great thing through you, but you need to make a sacrifice on behalf of the message that I just gave you. And what we fail to understand is that Greatness requires sacrifice. You think of almost anybody it is that you look up to, whether it be God himself, whether it be the people that we read about in the Bible, whether it be people that we know from our time, we usually are drawn to people who we have seen have made a sacrifice in some way, shape, or form. We can't help but to... Re it's like God designed us to respect people who have made sacrifices. Right. And so and so I, 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 I when I. And she might kill me for using this, but Courtney. Right. Yeah, look at her rolling her eyes. But so Courtney was with me at the conference on this past Sunday. And if you understand anything about this conference, I told a number of people, a number of my friends like back home or what have you um, that live near me in, 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 in Maryland or what have you, who who are looking for some guidance in their life. I told a number of them, listen, this is something that you might, want, if you're able to get to, you might want to get to it because you're going to learn some strategies that can help you to get your life structured and back on track. Now, the challenge that when you have low engagement you, and low risk, the returns are usually little. But when there's high engagement and high risk, the return is usually greater. So if you pay attention to the miracles of Christ, he said, pay attention to the first miracle that Christ did. It was actually very low engagement, very low risk. It wasn't even a miracle that he was trying to do per se. His mom was like, mom, I mean, his mom was like, son, please turn this water into wine. And Jesus is like, listen, it's not my time, but okay, whatever, like, I'll, I'll do it, right? Low engagement, low risk. But what he said was that not much really necessarily came out of that miracle, right? But he said, as you watch the, 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 the Christ continually steps up the level of miracles that he does, and the, the risk and the engagement become higher and higher and higher until you get to the point where he eventually sacrifices everything. But because he sacrifices everything, he is able to gain what? He's able to gain victory not only for himself, but his conquering of and his sacrifice allows everybody now to have the potential to overcome and to and to and to and to, and to, and to overcome death. Right. So. 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 But 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 watch this. That final miracle was high risk, high engagement. But the return on the investment of that miracle was greater than any of the other ones that he did prior. Right. So. So. So don't think that because you sacrifice that you're not going to get back. As a matter of fact, we are taught that the more you give, the more he gives to you. Sacrifice. So then the Bible says, in verse 18, it says, the angel of God said, what's this? 
you ask for my name, you wouldn't understand. It's sheer wonder. Verse 21. Skip on over to verse 21. Manoah and his wife never saw the angel of God again. Only then did Manoah realize that this was God's angel. Right? Or, or, or more specifically, he realized that he had been talking to God himself. Right? And that's the challenge. See, sometimes, for, for instance, we, we pay attention more so sometimes to the person delivering the message than to who the message is really from and what the message is. And the challenge that Manoah had is that because God manifested himself in the nature of a man, Manoah this whole time is looking at him like, okay, this is a man talking to me. Or let's even say an angel talking to me. All right, this is an angel talking to me. And what, we're, what, what, what we forget sometimes is that we, a person might come up to us. It, it would be very easy for you, and thank, thank God you all haven't done this, but it would be very easy for you all, because most of you are older than me, to say that this is just a young kid, 31 years old, I don't necessarily need to listen to him because I have more life experience than he does. What could he really have to offer me? Right? But none of you all have done that. It has been my experience that you all, at least you make me feel this way, that I have brought, that, that God has used me to bring something to the table and that God has spoken to me in such a way that has been beneficial for your lives also. Right? And so, praise God. And so the challenge is not limiting God to who or what he will minister to you through, right? And because the sooner that you can realize that it's God speaking, I, I had to realize that God was speaking through that situation earlier this week, right? And what some people did, like Moses could have missed the fact that God was about to speak to him through a bush that was on fire. Other people, God decided, listen, I'm going to speak a word to you through a donkey of all things. You see what I'm saying? So, 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 so be careful not to limit how God is speaking to you, because however he's speaking to you, you need to be able to hear it so that you can, you can know what are the next steps that God is requiring of you. Amen. Amen. And Manoah almost missed that. Manoah almost missed that. So then we go on to verse 22. He says, so Manoah says to his wife, where as good, now Manoah is a funny guy. So Manoah says, we're as good as dead. <laughs> We've looked on God. And thank goodness that he, he had a wife that was reasonable. And she says, but his wife said, if God were planning to kill us, he wouldn't have accepted our whole burnt offering and grain offering. Nor would he have revealed all these things to us and given us this birth announcement. Right? So, so you have to, so, so listen, you can be, this is why it's important to hear what God is saying. Because if God is, has spoken something to you, if God has told you specifically that I have made you pregnant with something and something will be birthed through you, then you can be confident that you, you can walk that thing out with no fear. Because, because Manoah is operating out of a spirit of fear. Oh man, uh, uh, God is about to, like we're about to be killed because we were just inside the presence of God. And his wife is like, what, what are you talking about? God has just told you that something is about to happen. If God has told you that I'm going to do something through your life, then you can be confident that your life is going to go on for a little while longer. Right? So you no longer have to live in fear about what's going to happen later on today, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen next month. No, God is going to finish the work that he has put you on earth to finish. Amen. Be confident. That, because what, what it's, it's been my, my, my experience, I've experienced this in the past, and I know a lot of other people, a lot of other Christians experience this, where we walk around in fear like, I hope I don't die today. You know, uh, and, and we walk around in the spirit of worrying. And I believe that God has not. The Bible tells us, as a matter of fact, that God has not told us to worry. He's telling us not to be anxious, but that if I have made certain promises to you, then I will fulfill those things. So live confidently. Until your death, believing that those things will come to pass. And oftentimes. They even come to pass in ways that we're like, oh, okay, I didn't know that it was going to look that way. But now when I look over it again, oh, oh, he did bring that thing to pass. So then we get on to verse 24, and I'm at my last point. So verse 24 says, 
the woman gave birth to a son. They named him Samson. The boy grew and God blessed him. The Spirit of God began working in him while he was staying at a Danite camp between Zorah and Eshtaol. Right? So pay attention to this. Pay attention to this. This, this, is, this is what I got from those final two verses. Let me make sure that I have it here in the sequence that I want it in my notes. All right, good, good. So watch this. They birthed, it says that the woman gave birth to a son. This is why that's significant. Because the lineage, when you talk about biblical things, lineage goes through the son, goes through the male child, right? Lineage doesn't pass through the female child. And what I got from that is, yes, God said that at one point you were barren, but now you are pregnant. Not only are you pregnant, but you will deliver. Uh, you, you, you will birth this thing, right? And this thing will, he talks about going on to deliver or what have you. But after you birth this thing, right? Specifically, you have birthed a son, which means that this thing, this blessing will now carry on to future generations, right? So a legacy of, you have in essence birthed a legacy. So now even after you die, the legacy will be allowed to keep on going and won't die with what was birthed only. Why? Because you birthed a son, right? Not that there's anything with birthing a daughter, but because you birthed a son, the legacy can now continue after you're dead and gone. And so, and so, and so it's not what God is birthing in you is to leave a legacy. So, so, so going back to even when we talk about men like Martin Luther King, so what he put in, he puts a dream inside of Martin Luther King, and even after Martin Luther King, watch this, is sacrificed, or it sacrifices his life on behalf of the dream that God gave to him, right? But, but the legacy or, or the birth, the legacy continues. Why? Because what God birthed in him, he didn't just birth for his time, but he allows us, myself, standing here before you right now, I benefit even after Martin Luther King is dead because of what God put in Martin Luther King. And so God is looking to birth for, for, the, for what he's put in you to carry on way past when you have been alive. Matter of fact, the whole Bible, when you look at it, the Bible is the manifestations of the blessings on other people's life. And we are blessed because of the blessing that was on their life. Amen. And so the. Oh, and so watch this. Not only does it say that. Right. But in the verse, it says that it says that the boy, she gave birth to a son. Then it says what? It said they named him Samson, but it says that, and I didn't even touch on this, but that just stood out to me, the fact that they gave it a, him a name, right. right? And so what is the name of whatever it is that God is birthing in you? Can you, because a name is something that's very specific. So can you be very specific? When, can you get to the point where you can be very specific about what it is that God is trying to do in your life and birthing through you? So I watched that. I, I told you for a while, I couldn't understand, okay, God, I would like to get a PhD, but I don't even know if you're calling me to get a PhD, and I don't even know what I would do the PhD in. But now I'm able to name it now, right? Yeah. Okay, not, not just do a PhD, but specifically education, yeah. all right? So, so, so pray to God that he would give you the ability to name what it is that he's birthing in you. Put, put, put a name to it so that it'll be clearer. And then it says that, it says... Um, so, so it says, not only did, he name, not only did they name uh, the son, but it says that what was birthed grew, right? It grew. It didn't just stay at the same level that it was. It continued to expand itself, right? And then it says that not only did it grow, but th that God, well, him, uh, but God blessed him, right? And the spirit of the Lord began moving through him. So, so think of the blessing that is, that God has put within you? What skills and talents and gifts has he put in you for his glory to use on behalf of his glory? Because what he's saying is that once you identify what it is, he will grow that thing, he will bless that thing, and his spirit, he wants to move, his, he wants his spirit to move through that thing, right, at the appointed time. And so then, that he was alive. And that's why I thought that it was so beautiful, because 
God is saying if we do what we're supposed to, we, the, the Bible often talks about leaving inheritances or what have you to your children, to your children's children. And what I believe is that if we do what we're supposed to do, once again, God is trying to situate us and position us to deliver ourselves, our families, to deliver our communities, right? To deliver our loved ones. And what he's saying is that it won't just stop with you, but even in your death, if you do what's right, uh, and we kind of, I kind of alluded to this before, but even if you do what you're supposed to do, the legacy of the life that you lived will continue on and on and on and on. And others will continue to be affected. As a matter of fact, you will be more, even more powerful in, in your death than you were even in your life. And so, Father God, we are grateful that you have positioned us. That we could, that, that, that there are places in our lives that we have identified as being barren, being empty, uh, being a wilderness, Lord. But you have come that we might have life. And what you have said is that the life is already within us mm -hmm. and pregnant in us. And you're waiting for us to now begin to live that thing out, for that thing to now birth itself, for that thing to go from just being on the inside to manifesting itself on the outside. That other people might see, be blessed because of it, and they might be able to go forth and we might be able to see your power manifested and that they, others would be delivered because of the blessing that you have put in us. And so we've seen that thing begin happening in this church, Lord. We've seen it happening in the lives of the individuals here in this church. And we ask that you would continue, help us to keep the momentum, help us not to lose that momentum of the spirit, Lord, and help us to capitalize on that momentum that as people begin to hear about the individuals that go to Penuel SDA Church, they don't just associate it with folks that have good theoretical knowledge, but they associate it with folks who the power of God is being manifested in their lives and they need to be a part of it. And so we ask that we would live such lives, such lives, the, the lives that, 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 that we consider legendary, li le legendary Lord, the, the, the type of life that that when we are dead and gone, if you should decide not to come uh, before we pass away, that, that the story of our faith, the, the, the story of the manifestation of Christ in us would continue to carry on forward. That other people might be saved because when they hear about our testimonies, even though we're dead and gone, that other people will be saved because of our testimony, Lord. As a matter of fact, we even pray that we live the type of lives that even after we're dead and gone, not just that others will be saved, but that even more people would be saved even after we've died, Lord, than what we could even do in our natural lives. And that when we go to heaven, we will be look around and be shocked to see, like, who, who, are, these, who are these people who are up here in heaven? Like, like, I've never seen these faces before. And they might be able to say that, well, because you stayed faithful to Christ, and because you kept on running the race, and we just heard about the, what God did in your life, it made us believe that God could do something in our lives too. Mm -hmm. And so we ask that you would help us to hold on to, to, to that faith. For those of us who still feel like we're in that barren space, we all feel that way time to time, help us to hold on, Father God. Help us to be reminded that, that, that even as you were explaining it to, to, to the woman, Father God, you had to just say, you know what, forget it. Not only will you become pregnant, but you are even now pregnant. But help us to see it, Lord, because sometimes we're pregnant, we just don't see it. We thought we were barren, but we just didn't see the pregnancy that was within us, Lord. And so we, we, we pray these things in your most holy name, Father God, that we would live those lives, this type, that type of life, Lord, that we're supposed to live, that we would not settle for plan B, for plan C, for plan any of the alphabets, even on down to plan Z, but that we would settle only for plan A, and that we would fight for what we call the perfect life, Lord, that we would go after it, Lord, and not, not be shameful in going after it, not be afraid to go after it, but to go after it in confidence, knowing that you have said that we are the head and not the tail. 
Amen. And, and, and what I want to do, and it may not be anybody in here, but, but there might be somebody in here who you might feel like you are, part of you getting to that plan A that God has for your life is for you to take a step of baptism and to make that publicly manifest, that, that public declaration in front of the people God, understanding that if you honor God in front of people, in front of man, God is faithful that he will honor you in front of his father. And so do we have anybody who feels like that's a step that they need to make this morning? Anybody who just wants to rededicate themselves now, and this goes to everybody else, just rededicate to, the, to themselves to strategically and purposefully going after the plan A for their lives. You could just raise your hand. Everybody. Praise God. Father God, we're thankful that we have made a public declaration even on this day that we will not settle for those other plans, Lord. But now, I prayed about it before, Lord, but now your people have raised their hands saying that they will go after it, Lord. But help us not to be like the children of Israel who thought that they could do it themselves. Uh, but even right now, we pray that we would submit ourselves fully to you, that the all-powerful spirit might dwell within us to accomplish those things which are impossible for us to accomplish. We believe that you will do it, and as a matter of fact, not only will you do it, but you are doing it right now. You are working it right now. Amen.